This is the second in the series of our lectures looking at consumerism, conformity, and control in American society during the immediate post-World War II years. In the first lecture, we looked at the ways in which World War II and the GI Bill provided the foundations for an expanded consumer economy after the war. In this lecture, we're going to look at the first of three entrepreneurs who took advantage of the changes in American society and made their own marks on the way Americans live, even today. The first entrepreneur we're going to consider is William Levitt, who was a pioneer in suburban development after World War II. Some of you may know people who live in one of the Levitt towns in Pennsylvania, New York, or New Jersey, or you may even have lived in one yourself. The suburbs as we know them today were a phenomenon of the post-World War II era. As we said in the first lecture of this series, before World War II, most people grew up, lived, worked, and raised their families close to the place where they themselves had been born. This was true for city dwellers as well as rural populations. But things changed after World War II. First, new families were being formed by young people who had not grown up in the same city or even state or even region of the country and had seen a good bit of the country and the world. They did not have the same family and community ties as their parents. Many met their future mates in college as enrollments expanded dramatically following the war for both men and women. Second, New jobs often required relocation. Third, most new jobs were located in cities and urban housing quickly became completely inadequate and overpriced. Fourth, access to cities from outlying areas was being expanded by the development of highways, railways, subways, and rapid buses. Fifth, the GI Bill provided Veterans Administration, or VA, loans. These provided low interest rates and no down payments for veterans when purchasing a home. The first person to see the opportunities in this set of circumstances was William Levitt who developed a series of communities called Levitt Towns. These became America's first planned suburban communities. The first person to see the opportunities in this set of circumstances was William Levitt, who developed a series of communities called Levitt Towns. These became America's first planned suburban communities. William Levitt was an interesting man who learned a lot from his service in the Navy Seabees during World War II. Levitt served in the Pacific Theater during the war. When the Allies would take an island, the Seabees would be sent in to construct a military base. Time was of the essence, and Levitt learned increasingly efficient means of construction. A lot of what he learned was how to speed things up through the division of labor and specialization. After the war, Levitt saw the critical need for housing in New York City for veterans and their young families, and he began to ponder solutions. Levitt understood several realities. He understood that the cities were already overcrowded. He knew that many veterans were not originally from cities and didn't particularly like them. He knew that the expanding rail and bus lines provided easy and fast transportation to and from New York City. And he understood that veterans like himself wanted to own their own homes and raise their families in a place that was quieter and greener than New York City. So when Levitt spotted a potato farm for sale on Long Island, that had easy access to highways, 
rail, and bus lines, he saw it as a golden opportunity. Not to grow potatoes, but to build homes within a self-contained suburban environment. So what was new and inventive about this? First, communities had generally been built to serve an industry. Towns grew up around steel mills or tobacco warehouses or cattle railheads or other industries that needed workers. Levittown was different. There was no local industry bringing people to Levittown. Levittown workers were commuters who worked in New York City. There were a number of new and inventive elements in the construction of Levittown also. The houses were all prefab, meaning that the parts, whenever possible, were constructed off-site. Some of you may be familiar with today's prefab homes and aware that one of the big advantages of fabrication off-site is price. So the homes were made of prefabricated parts that were delivered to the home site. The parts were put together by specialized crews. Each crew completed one of the 27 steps required by the Levitt method to complete the home, and each step was controlled by a separate contractor who was responsible for his supply chain and workers. Steps were completed in a certain order by crews who moved down the street from one house to the next as their step was completed. Levitt limited the number of models of homes that were available also. Every few years he would change the models, but there were always only four or five models being built at any one time. Each model had several different facades in order to create a sense of more diversity than there really was. Levitt also cut out the middlemen wherever he could in order to save money. For example, he, brought, he bought direct from the factory when he could and even bought his own nail factory to supply his construction needs. This division of labor allowed Levitt crews to construct 12 houses per day. Levitt built seven communities and 17,000 homes in only four years. That first Levitt town was built on Long Island, 10 miles from New York City. But Levitt built more than just houses. He built communities. He built schools and shopping centers and parks. He targeted veterans with young families. The homes were not large, but they were larger than city apartments and were situated on decent-sized lots. In that first Levitt town, all the homes had two bedrooms and one bath. They were either four or five rooms, depending on whether or not they had a separate dining room. Levitt's efficiencies of scale allowed him to offer a fully furnished home for $8,000 and an unfurnished home for just under $7,000. VA loans and federal subsidies allowed veterans to move into a home for about $400 with a monthly payment of about $60. In some cases, veterans didn't have to put any money down at all. This is an advertisement for the Cape Cod model, which was very popular. In fact, all of the original homes in the Long Island Levitt town were Cape Cods. They simply had different fronts. The new homes were clean, attractive, and had lawns and sidewalks for safe walking. They also promised young families that they would have neighbors of similar age, lots of children for their kids to play with, and a clean and safe community where a young family could grow and prosper. But what does suburbia have to do with conformity and control? It's rather easy to see the conformity of Levittown houses. 
But did that translate into conformity in life? Critics said that it did. Even though many small towns offered few, if any, choices for shopping, dining, entertainment, schooling, etc., critics of the suburbs claimed that they were even more restrictive, as the town was virtually emptied of men each day, leaving women and children, all relatively of the same age and background, to do the same things with the same people in order to achieve the same goals. Houses, yards, cars, people, all interchangeable parts, said critics. Adding to the conformity, and certainly to the control, were the rigid community covenants. Lawns had to be mowed at least once a week. All plantings, like trees and flowers, exterior paint, and visible improvements required prior approval from the Levittown board. No Jews or African Americans, essentially no minorities, could purchase homes in the community. Levitt towns may not have been in the South, but they were all white and all Christian. Critics saw growing trends in consumerism as a means to control Americans by encouraging them to define themselves by their things. You buy a home, you need things to go in it. If furniture styles change, you need a new couch. If car body styles dramatically change every two years, which they did, your two-year-old car suddenly looks very outdated. If the Ladies Home Journal says that yellow appliances are out and turquoise ones are in, how can your wife invite her book club over? It became a joke, but maybe not a very funny one that the newest appliance or lawnmower or bicycle or family vacation spot was necessary in order for your family to keep up with the Joneses. Perhaps Americans were being controlled by an increasing need to own things and spend money on fads and trends. Levitt himself pointed to the link between home ownership and politics when he said, no man who owns his own house and lot can be a communist. He has too much to do. One of the critics of white suburbia was Malvina Reynolds. Reynolds was an activist and folk singer. The daughter of Jewish immigrant parents, she earned a Ph.D. in English literature from Berkeley. Her song, Little Boxes, is a cute but very real critique of white suburban life. If the link here won't work, it is posted in a document between this lecture and the next and in the document that provides the YouTube links to all the lectures. The song is a great little piece of protest music, so check it out. 